Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie D. Simone, and I serve as the Curator of Contemporary Art at the Portland Museum of Art. And I am here today with artist Hunt Slonem, who is in our collection and has an upcoming show at Elizabeth Moss Galleries. Hi, Hunt. Hi. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. So Welcome what I thought I would... <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you. We were talking um, offline before we started recording about your return to Maine, at least through your artwork. Uh, so I don't know if you could start by maybe saying something about your relationship to Maine. Well, I was born there in um, 1951 on a, in a hospital on an island. Uh, my father was a career naval officer and he was actually at MIT and they were summering in Maine when I was born there. Um, so I just lived there for a brief time as a newborn child. I was born in July. Um, and then I later went to the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture between my junior and senior years in um, Tulane University and had an incredible experience. That's really what brought me to New York. And it was a life-changing um, event in my life. And then later I went back to Maine and I had a big show at the Colby Museum when Hugh Gorley was the director. Well, welcome back. I am going to share my screen because we are fortunate that you are in the Portland Museum of Art's permanent collection. Um, and we have some earlier works of yours. So I thought maybe you could share some insight into these and maybe frame them in what viewers will expect to see um, in your new show coming up at the gallery. Well, these are very, very early works of mine. They're from the um, early 80s, um, conceived in the late 70s. I was doing a lot of um, paintings with religious themes at that time. Um, New York was kind of on fire with religious um, shows. I was in something called Resurrection, Precious at the Gray Gallery, where my painting of San Martin de Porres was on the cover of the leisure section of the times about religion has impact on contemporary art. The, um, there was stigmata, there were just dozens and dozens of shows, mostly starting in the East Village. I actually took a course um, on the book of Revelations when I did these paintings from chapter four on the wing figure with eyes covering his entire body and um, McDermott and McGough were in our class, and we all did these paintings for a show called Revelation. Um, and um, it was a short-lived delving into this theme. The monkeys have existed on to the present in my work, as well as birds and butterflies, which were later singled out. So they're very formative works of mine. I think they're... Um, strong works. I think the Portland Museum really picked some good, good early stuff of mine. Uh, there's one. Can we switch to a different painting? Absolutely. Okay. One? Here's another Book of Revelations piece um, with the Diffenbachia leaves. There's always something personal that um, represents my experience, uh, just a little footnote of my life. I'm a plant freak and I grow orchids and I have millions of birds. Um, so I put a different Bacchia leaf in. Um, anyway, the Met bought a painting I did of San Martin de Porres, which is another one that's about to come up, on his Saints Day. Um, and the Newark Museum bought the one that was in the Times at that time and it was hanging for years at the entrance of the museum. Do you want to switch again? Sure. I think, so can I go back to this work and thinking about the other work too? Um, yeah. Something I've been admiring, and I know that you've carried forward into your practice, is this idea of repetition. So I wondered if you could just talk about the inspiration behind that um, and some of your formal decisions in this work and the work that you're doing today. Well, I was talking about it. Um, it's, we, I took classes on revelations in the East Village for this show that was created that a group of us were in. And I did a whole group of paintings, not more than four or five though. Another huge one, the biggest one of all, 
which is sold in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, mm -hmm. to a collector of mine. Um, and it had been rolled up for 30 years. <laughs> I now have an armory where I can unstretch and save all my early works, which I didn't have room for in the earlier part of my career. Um, these went to museums right away. Most of the same things did go to museums, interestingly. Um, it's about the figure in the book with, that is covered from head to toe with eyes. I put in the sheet as a um, you know symbol that they represent of um, being close to God and harbors of divine energy. Um, and the rest of it's just made up. I mean, there's a little bit of a reference. I always have this thing about place of birth island and so there's kind of a loose island in the middle of this, <laughs> which refers to Maine. Okay. Uh, and um, anyway, what else can I tell you? Well, I think there's, I think in this early work and how it's, this context is really important thinking about that class you took and this interest in um, uh, visualizing spiritual um, narratives perhaps and how absolutely it's absolutely directly from the book of revelations i had never studied it before it was not a long-lived course but it was very inspiring this is a painting of san martin de porres who's a peruvian saint who wasn't made a saint till um the 1960s he's a contemporary of rose of lima who was the first saint of the new world who was painted by everybody from tiapolo to just super star of her day. San Martin, who was um, very mystical, he would levitate to the height of the cross in the church at night. He would buy locate to heal people. Just bazillions of miracles. Anyway, he attracted me. I traveled to Peru. I went to his tomb and Rose of Lima's by chance. I was having shows in Ecuador and I came back with all these holy cards and things that I collected. I was also an exchange student in Nicaragua in high school and just amassed all this stuff in my travels. And I started working from holy cards, but San Martin symbols are a cat, a dog, a mouse, and a broom. And I ad-libbed, I put um, families of bunnies. I now paint rabbits almost constantly, <laughs> which stem from these early works. This one, I've added a peacock, a dove, a macaw, a Amazon parrot, and um, everything else is pretty true to the way he's portrayed. Yeah, fascinating. And speaking of parrots, we have a watercolor um, that looks very similar to the birds that we're seeing behind you in your studio. Yes, the watercolors, um, Henry Geltzeller is one of his 14 favorite artists. When he died, they did an article. And he actually asked for my paintings in his hospital room. You know, he was, you know who he was, right? The contemporary at the Met. <clears throat> Very influential in the world at that time. And a wonderful man. He wrote my first catalog essay. But he loved my watercolors. He thought they were like Hoffman and said, this is no light compliment. But anyway, I got walking pneumonia one year and I couldn't paint in oil and I started playing with watercolor and gouache and I did thousands of them and I just really loved working in that way. And it's kind of stopped in recent years, but um, a lot of breakthroughs in my work happened at that time. And I, it led to the cross hatching marks that I make in the bird paintings. Um, somehow it started first in watercolor um all kinds of compositional and color um changes occurred in this form i was also doing a lot of life drawing and pen and ink um at that time as well i was doing a lot of paperwork because of my um pneumonia situation <laughs> that's unfortunate but it sounds also like it's produced a lot but, of yes I wonder um, if you could share a little bit about your interest in birds. Um, I'm working under the assumption that you have an aviary and perhaps you some of them in the background. Um, are any, are, 
Do you think we're going to see any of those works in the show coming up at the gallery? Um, there are some, yes. I have had up to 200 birds in my aviary over the years. I'm now paring down because I travel and I have seven historic homes that I'm saving and I'm just a time issue. I've had the same bird keeper for 44 years. <laughs> um, but I have always lived with birds my whole life. It started in Hawaii as a child when we lived there. Where I'm pretty much the same person I was when I was two years old <laughs> and had to answer a question in school what we wanted to do when we grew up. I drew a picture of myself painting it at an easel. So I've never been conflicted. It was just making it a reality. I mean, I always did it. it is to have Dogan fantasies in Hawaii as a kid. Oh. Um, you know, and my work is about, um, the, and that watercolor in particular is my two eclectus parrots. They're dimorphic. The female is red and the male is green. And they're named Apollo and Venus. And they were, they were all adopted. They were given to me by a shelter. I usually get a call. But I'm, as I said, I'm trying to pare down and I've aligned myself with a, somebody who's on a much higher level than I ever could be for bird keeping on a massive scale. Um, in fact, I gave him recently one of my 80 year old parrots that I'd had for 40 something years that was blind and they were able to perform an operation and the bird can see a little bit again now and move, has a huge range of motion. So um, I try to do whatever is the right thing. That's with good. These creatures and they live forever, yeah. you know. They'll outlive us. Well, thank you. Maybe for not. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Hopefully not. I'm um, wine for checking out. Thank you for sharing some insight into your um, more historic works, if we want to say that, that are in the museum's holding. Is there any final thought um, to the viewers about your work or what you'd like them to know coming up? Well, my work is about nature. It's about a last look at nature and this horrific time of losing forests and rainforests. And it's just, I just want to cry when I think of Brazil and Australia and the billions of animals that we've lost that no longer have a habitat that represents 60 million years of evolution. And we will never even have a record of half of what's there. It's so scary to me. And it's happened before. The Sahara Desert was a jungle at one time, and it was logged by different civilizations. And Greece used to be have millions of kinds of animals that we don't even have records of. There were many hippopotamus is one thing. So the world is always changing, but this is a really big transition right now. So my thing is to revere nature, to look at it, to honor it. Um, I make these marks very often, which refer to the disappearing of it, to see it through the veil, that it will always exist, but it may not be in our current reality form. Um, I mean, they didn't even know the dodo was extinct until they tried to go out and create, capture another specimen for the British Museum in the 1700s. And it's just so sad that the, the statements that you read and how you know, these things will never be seen by anybody. Not that we're so important, but it would be nice to have had a record of evolution. I mean, they're always discovering new things slowly, um, and they continually appear in Brazil and the sea. Anyway, so my reference is nature. I think during the pandemic that nature has really taken quite a turn for the positive. I see the most beautiful landscapes, forests. I have homes upstate and in the south and in Pennsylvania, and nature has never been more beautiful. I just can't even believe I'm on the same roads. I mean, I don't know what's happened. That maybe our lack of use of fossil fuel at this time is really making a dent, but we're really being rewarded, except for the fires. God almighty. Um, so I feel both horrified and optimistic at the same time. I think that nature can come back, but these 
ancient places that took so long um, will not come back in our lifetimes or anyone's we will <laughs> be related to probably. So I'm just all about spirit and nature and um, the joy and upliftment and the complexity of the creation of the world. And this is where my eye falls. Well, thank you for having that eye and for sharing some of it with us. I think your passion comes across in your work and we're really lucky that Liz is bringing this back to Maine. So thank you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be coming back and I had wonderful walks and forests and Maine is just so rich and nature and so unspoiled. Thank you. Great to speak.